Hi, welcome, uh, everyone. Delighted that you could join us this evening. My name is Am Joel I'm director of SFU's Van City Office of Community Engagement. I also wanted to welcome everyone watching online, including my graduate liberal studies students who are out there. Um, I just wanted to uh, begin by recognizing that we're on the territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh peoples as a post-secondary institution and a school for contemporary arts. Just wanted to reiterate the importance of decolonization and the important work of uh, the calls uh, to action from the, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission. I wanted to um, just begin by uh, saying how excited we are to have John Valiant uh, with us today. I had a chance to spend time with John a couple months back recording uh, a podcast uh, with him, followed his work for, for many years. He was here about a decade ago uh, at a screening uh, for the, the Tiger, uh, which is uh, uh, where he also spoke about his uh, book. So it's been wonderful to reconnect with him and seeing the, the remarkable success and timeliness um, of this book. Uh, I just wanted to thank, uh, besides the Ben City Office of Community Engagement, also the Jim Green Foundation for sponsoring this event, this event the Community Engaged Research Initiative, and our media uh, sponsor, the Georgia Strait. Um, after John um, speaks, I'll introduce him uh, shortly. We also have a few guests who I'll introduce in a more fulsome way. Afterwards, we'll be responding uh, to John, Seth Klein, Tara Mahoney, and Jeff Mann will be joining us uh, via Zoom. I'll introduce them um, after John um, uh, finishes. Uh, and immediately after the event as well, we're going to be having a reception in the World Art Center, which you're all welcome to come to, and John will be available to sign books. And Iron Dog Books is, was here just outside uh, the room, and they'll be inside uh, the room able to uh, sell copies of, of John's book um, as well. Uh, John is an author and freelance writer whose work has appeared in The New Yorker, The Atlantic, National Geographic, and The Guardian. The Golden Spruce, his first book, was a bestseller and won several awards, including the Governor General and Writers' Trust Awards for nonfiction. His second nonfiction book, The Tiger, won the BC Achievement Award for nonfiction, was a bestseller selected for Canada Reads, and has been published in 16 languages. It was the first book of John's that I read, and it was just a page turner. I couldn't, I couldn't put it down. Um, uh, Jaguar's Children, which was long listed for the Dublin Impact and Kirkus Fiction Prizes, and was a finalist for the Writers Trust Fiction Prize. His latest book, Fireweather, number one national bestseller, finalist for the National Book Award, winner of the prestigious Bailey Gifford Prize, and nominated for the Writers Trust Nonfiction Prize. Uh, everyone, please give a warm hometown welcome to John Valiant. Uh, hello. It's, a, it's really good to, to see you and see you again. Um, I've really been on the road a lot and it really feels good to be home and know that I'm within walking distance of my bed and <laughs> in almost in, uh, in kiss-blowing distance of my dear wife who's right over there. So she's been away for weeks, I've been away and so it's very nice to, to come home in this way. Um, really glad to be here with all of you on this land, uh, in this room. And uh, especially want to thank Am Johal for shepherding this event for many months and the mighty Iron Dog for um, uh, carrying my books. Um, so I'm going to do a kind of a bit of reading, bit of talking, and um, I'm just going to motor on. Uh, and then there'll be time for Q&A and things after. But, you know, thank you so much for coming out. And uh, it's, just, it's been a while since I've been here, and it's really good to to see your faces, some of which are familiar and all of which appear friendly thus far. So, um, uh, so I spent the past seven years uh, researching fire weather because it was clear to me that climate disruption, of which fire is just one manifestation, is the issue of our time. It's an atmospheric issue, it's an environmental issue, it's a political issue, it's an energy issue, it's an infrastructure issue, and it's a social justice issue. Climate disruption will impact every aspect of our lives for the rest of our lives. If there was ever any doubt that this was so, last summer settled it. We've all seen the smoke, and too many of us have seen the fire. And it's not just Canada. Things feel different now. Weather is different now. And fire is different now. 
the Earth's expressions are intensifying and accelerating. Almost exactly a century ago, the American writer Ernest Hemingway uh, wrote a novel called The Sun Also Rises. And there are a couple of lines in it that have been on my mind lately. How did you go bankrupt, Bill asked. Two ways, Mike said, gradually and then suddenly. This applies equally well to the last 50 years of observed and tracked climatic changes. Scientists have been warning of these anthropogenic CO2-driven changes for 70 years, and now they're upon us. We know the air is getting hotter because we can feel it. The heat dome of 2021 that broke records day after day and killed nearly 700 British Columbians is still a raw memory for many of us. And so is the atmospheric river that inundated the Fraser Valley. What appears to be happening now is a, a nonlinear acceleration. Radical extremes are being felt all over the world. Look at any metric of planetary distress. These are Antarctic sea ice anomalies. Um, what you see in the kind of blue and purple lines are annual fluctuations over the past 25 years. And then 2023 has sort of marched off by itself to, to a new low. Uh, these, uh, almost the opposite situation, global sea surface temperature anomalies from 1980s, past 40 years, 1982 to 2023. You see fluctuations, and then you see this red line, which is uh, 2023, again, just moving off uh, into far warmer water. Um, it was uh, the coastal waters around uh, Key West, Florida, were 37 Celsius. Um, they were also about seven degrees above normal off the, off the coast of Ireland. These are uh, global surface air temperature anomalies. Again, the, the blue are, uh, this is since 1940, so past 80 years. The blue is you know, further back, and then you can see it steadily warming, steadily warming as it turns to orange. And once again, 2023 is just in its own class. So this is a term that we all need to learn for the 21st century, and that's discontinuity, an event or situation wherein past experience ceases to be a useful guide to future problem solving. Alex Steffen is a futurist and writer based out of Berkeley, and I've been following him on Twitter for a while, and he's just a very lucid, uh, clear thinker. Uh, firefighters have been experiencing discontinuity more and more often over the past decade or two, and this year has been relentless. Seriously, how are you supposed to respond to this. So FRP is fire radiative power. It's the raw energy coming off the leading edge of a wildfire. And a fellow named Neil LaRoe from the University of Nevada basically calculated how much raw energy was coming off last season's forest fires cumulatively. Now normally, uh, fire energy is measured in megawatts. That's a million watts. What came out of Canada last summer was so intense that they had to basically recalibrate it to terawatts. A terawatt is a trillion watts. It's the kind of energy that you power Tokyo with or Manhattan. And Canada's fires generated about 42 terawatts of, of raw energy coming out of our forests and some of our homes. 16, and actually now it's up to 18 million hectares of Canadian forest have burned, that's roughly Cambodia, or Uruguay, or Florida, or Oklahoma. This is, uh, yeah, hectares burned, that's actually uh, increased. This, this uh, chart is no longer uh, uh, up to date. Um, this is kind of an interesting graph. Um, so this goes back to 2003. The gray are Canada's industrial emissions. The orange are uh, f uh, emissions from wildfire in, the, in our country. And you see it fluctuating, but the one thing that stays the same uh, are our emissions. And if you look at any other G7 countries, industrial emissions, they're all decreasing. 
Almost all of them have been, de been decreasing for almost the past 15 years. And Canada is really an outlier. It really hasn't uh, decreased much at all. And um, the, uh, the tar sands of Alberta broke the 4 million barrel a day mark. They're all quite excited about that up there. And down at the end here uh, is 2023's uh, emissions. And it's that crazy orange line that almost looks like it's part of something else. But it's part of this whole story that we're currently uh, living through right now. So this is another way to measure uh, climate change and fire's impact. Um, about a quarter of a million Canadians were on the road last summer fleeing wildfire. Tens of thousands more were sitting, standing, poised at the ready, not sure if they would have to evacuate or not. Uh, and it's, you know, Canada is a nation that has prides itself on helping refugees from other countries. And it's not used to and not prepared for the idea of having refugees within its own country. And I saw that, you know, first signs of that after the Fort McMurray fire, but it was kind of a no-go zone. You know, to, to use language like that around that fire uh, seems somehow heretical. Uh, but now, you know, it, it's, harder to, uh, it's harder to avoid. So we're not used to this. We're not ready for it. And I'm here to tell you that this is not the new normal. What this is, is clima incognita. It's the unknown climate. Its characteristics so far are instability and a tendency toward whipsawing extremes. Air temperatures, ocean temperatures, ocean currents, the jet stream, these systems fundamental to planetary Holocene stability no longer in the generally predictable ways they used to be. Thomas Smith, an environmental geographer at the London School of Economics, summed it up this way. He said, I'm not aware of a similar period when all parts of the climate system were in record-breaking or abnormal territory. Simply put, we've supercharged the system. And now the Earth has a fever. And we're all feeling it. Last summer, Phoenix, Arizona broke 110 Fahrenheit, that's 43 Celsius, every day for about two months straight. Last summer, um, let's see, uh, seven of California's top 10 largest fires have occurred in the past three years alone. And according to NASA, 2023 was the hottest year on record. But that's already in the past. Another way to think about it is that 2023 is likely to be the coolest year, one of the coolest years in the next several decades. So we're in an extraordinary epochal moment. Never before have technology, culture, and nature been moving so quickly simultaneously. Historically, it's been humans who've outpaced the natural world. From arrowheads to AI, our species has progressed steadily faster than geologic time, leaving indelible marks as we go. But now atmospheric time, climate time, is moving as fast, in some cases faster, than we are. Faster than technology, faster than history. The world we thought we knew is changing under our feet because we changed it. As Vancouver's own William Gibson said, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. I began to understand the implications of this acceleration and of the consequences when Fort McMurray caught on fire in May 2016. Fort McMurray, Alberta, it turns out, is an instructive place to try to make sense of these rapid changes. It's also a good place to learn about fire and petroleum and how they fuel the volatile and all-consuming appetites of petrocapitalism. There are a couple of pieces to this, and I'm going to go through them in the order that I first explored them. I'll start with the fire. If you live in Canada, here's a term you need to know. The WUI, 
Uh, the wildland urban interface is where the built environment, where we live, butts up against the wild land. And in Canada's case, most of that is forest. Um, and this is tough because for, we're forest people. And a lot of the people who move to Canada from other places are also forest people. It's a place we want to be. It's a place we want to live. And it's manifesting itself in some new and frightening ways. Um, we're drawn to it, we take solace from it, and yet uh, it's become extraordinarily flammable. And um, about half of Canadian homes are in the WUI. And that's, maybe you're living in the West End next to Stanley Park, or maybe you're living in Smithers, but you're, uh, in your way, you're uh, in the WUI. So this is kind of an alarming picture. This is uh, May 2nd, 2016. It's about 6 in the evening. You can see the sun still quite high there, trying to poke through that head of smoke. Uh, we're looking west from Fire Hall 5 and Fort McMurray. Fort Fire Hall 5 is about 8 kilometers south of downtown. And it's on a little rise. It's a bit hard to tell in this photo, but it gives you a very good vantage of what's around you. And what's out there is an absolutely ferocious fire that had expanded by about 500 times in 24 hours. And despite being identified in a timely fashion, really minutes after it first uh, burst into view, uh, water bombers and hotshot crews could not subdue it and it just pr proceeded to expand, and it grew all night. Um, so I wrote uh, a book about this, and <clears throat> I'm going to read you a, a short little section. Um, In Fort McMurray, May 3rd began differently for everyone, but it ended the same. For Chandra Linder, it began with a rite of spring. Linder was a labor relations advisor who worked for Sincrude. Linder's husband, Corey, an engineer, was employed there too, and so were many of their friends. Blonde, with a pixie cup, Linder is fit and warm and does not suffer fools. And it makes sense once you get to know her, but to an outsider, it might be surprising to see someone so polished and female in such a remote industry-oriented, testosterone-heavy place. So that the average ratio of men to women up there at the work sites uh, is about 25 to 1. And if you want to get a better understanding of how weird that is and overdetermined it is, I recommend uh, Ducks by Kate Beaton, which a lot of you are probably familiar with. Really potent uh, graphic uh, memoir. Uh, for work, Linder dresses accordingly. Minimal makeup, High collars, dark pants, no heels. Clothes suitable for climbing in and out of trucks and SUVs, for working in a world of working men. Linder had already seen the smoke plume southwest of town because everyone had seen it. A windswept cauliflower of billowing grays and browns that appeared to have sprouted full-blown from the forest on Sunday afternoon. It had been growing since then, but it was still miles away, and it wasn't the only one. Over the weekend, the Linders had hosted friends evacuated due to another fire. It was almost a lark. They took photos of the big plume developing across the river the same way one would a sunset or a rainbow. Their friends went home the next day because forestry was on it. Boots were on the ground. Water, bomber, water bombers were in the air. As far as the Linders were concerned, whatever was out there was being handled because that's what people do in Fort McMurray. They handle things. Certainly the beginning of May was a little early for fires. There were still car-sized blocks of winter ice on the riverbanks, and some of the local lakes had yet to thaw. But otherwise, this was nothing new. Fires cloud the horizon every spring and summer up here, as Chandra and Corey Linder said, practically in unison. It happens every year. Given the unseasonable heat, it was 33 Celsius that day, 
and the fact that five separate wildfires had ignited around the city that weekend, it's hard to overstate how unconcerned was Fort McMurray's citizenry. But if you were up at dawn on May 3rd, as Chandra Linder was, and you had seen the sky so full of summer promise as she had, you might understand why. The brilliance of that morning was so exceptional that after her morning shower, Linder did something she hadn't done in a long time. She pulled out her favorite navy blue suit with the skirt, picked some medium heels to go with it, and left her socks in the drawer. And thus attired, she headed off to work at Sincrude's head office. In her garage, there were a few vehicles to choose from. And in keeping with her outfit and her mood, Linder picked the car she calls the little one, a black Porsche that hadn't seen daylight in six months. To give you an idea of incomes up there, two years after a global downturn in energy prices that really impacted Fort McMurray, uh, the median household income in Fort McMurray in 2016 was still $200,000 a year. So it's a different kind of place, different kind of cars. Winters are long and dark in Fort McMurray, but this one was over, spring was here, and Linder felt as beautiful and hopeful as the day. So now we're going to jump ahead about four hours. Still feeling the symptoms of spring fever, Chandra Linder knocked off work at lunch and organized herself for a 2 o'clock meeting at Sincrude's downtown office in the Borealis building. With no traffic, it's a 30-minute drive down the highway. Still 20 kilometers north of downtown, she was rounding a long, gradual bend in the river when her windshield filled with something she did not recognize. When I got that first view of it, said Linder, I went, hang on a second. It was clear overhead, but to the south, it was black. Black smoke with streaks of red in it. It took up the whole sky. I'm trying to make sense of this thing. I'm thinking, maybe it just looks closer than it is. I'm thinking, maybe the red is shining through the smoke. But it's not the sun. It's in the wrong place. And then I realize it's flame. Linder had seen a lot of fire plumes, but this didn't look like any of them. So I pull over to the side of the highway, and I call my guy Byron, and I say, are we having this meeting? And he's like, no, we are not having this meeting. Don't come in. And I'm like, I'm looking at a wall of flames here. It was a short call, in part because no one was quite sure what to say next. What do you say on a beautiful spring day when the city where you live and conduct business appears to be on fire? After hanging up, Linda continued on to her exit, where she turned west, back up the hill, and out of the river valley. Okay, she said, not right, but here's what I do. I'm going to go home anyway. I drive past the dry cleaners. Well, I'm going to drop off my stuff at Sam's place, because in my mind, the fire's still on the other side of the river, downtown. So I'm dropping my stuff off, and this guy comes in from the golf course in full golf apparel, and he's like, holy shit, we just got evacuated from the golf course. And I'm like, well, what are you doing here? And he says, well, I'm here to pick up my dry cleaning. <laughs> and I said, what golf course were you on? Because we have two in town. And he says, thick wood, meaning the fire has just jumped the river. The Athabasca River by the Thickwood Golf Course is half a kilometer wide. So, continued Linder, Sam the dry cleaner, who's our buddy, is on the phone to his wife. Honey, it just jumped the river. Get out, get out, get out. In all this craziness, Sam still takes my dry cleaning, <laughs> logs it, and he's like, Tuesday good? <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, next Tuesday's great. At 2 o'clock in the afternoon on May 3rd, Linder tucked her laundry ticket safely in her wallet and aimed the Porsche for home. So thus far, no evacuation 
uh, had been called. It may surprise you to know, uh, uh, and yet, um, the long-term climate science and the short-term meteorology predicting the conditions that led up to the Fort Mac fire were perfect, perfect. But it was the interpretation that caused trouble. And we have to look at local pressure the leadership was under, in this case, the bitumen industry. In addition to being a logistical nightmare, there were millions of incentives not to evacuate preemptively and not to shut down. So uh, Chandra Linders heading up it's about a little after 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And this next photo was taken at 2.45. So they're evacuating. Um, this is um, in the Beacon Hill neighborhood on the west side. Uh, Centennial Park campground is already burned. Um, Abisand is next on the menu. This fellow, Paul Ayers, took this photo over the hood of his truck. He's inside, of course. Um, you can see the fire reflected in, his, in the hood. Uh, in those cars in front are his wife and his daughter in separate vehicles. Um, what's happening there is these, basically, these fireballs of combusting gases coming out of the, uh, the black spruce and, and aspen trees and rolling over the road. Um, I don't really know how anybody managed to live uh, through that, um, but they did. Um, and I had, um, let's see, um, I asked Paul if he had uh, the presence of mind to look at the thermometer on his dashboard. And he did, and he said it was 66 Celsius. And uh, he felt a thud, and a, a deer on fire ran into his truck. And they couldn't move because they were all, there's one road out. Most of these housing developments all around Fort Mac, most new housing developments in general have one road in, one road out. They were all stopped at Highway 63 because Highway 63 was already jammed with traffic. All the trees um, uh, along, along the highway uh, were also um, on fire. So once again, gradually and then suddenly. This, metaphorically speaking, is where we're at with our own response to climate change. So 21st century fire is a, is a term that I coined. Uh, for the purposes of this book, because 21st century fire seems to have some distinctive characteristics. And one of them is speed. And what made this fire burn so huge, so hot, and so fast is not only was it 33 degrees Celsius, which is about 10 degrees Fahrenheit above the pre-existing high for that date, and about 10 degrees, um, sorry, 10 degrees Celsius above the norm, um, and, um, but it was also uh, extraordinarily dry. And so I looked into that. And uh, the relative humidity that day and for days following was around 11 or 12 percent. And I don't really know what that means. Sounds dry. <laughs> so, but my job is to, to find out these things. So I went looking around for places where 11 percent humidity was normal. And you have to go to Death Valley in the month of July to find a normal relative humidity of 11 or 12 percent. That's what it was in Fort McMurray. There aren't a lot of trees in De Death Valley. Uh, there are a whole lot of trees in Fort McMurray. And so when you combine desert dryness with South California heat, and you put a fire in the middle of it in the boreal forest, which is already a flammable system, you're going to have not just have a fire, you're going to have an extraordinarily explosive situation. And so what, um, what was happening, the fire coming in from the southwest, entering the city, uh, fire, like a candle, projects heat. Uh, that's called radiant heat. It moves at the speed of light, and it's the same heat that tells you not to touch the candle. That's radiant heat. Moves at the speed of light. The heat coming out of this fire into the city of Fort McMurray was 500 Celsius. So that's hotter than Venus. And there are no trees on Venus either. 
Um, so when you get that kind of heat projecting into a forest or into a neighborhood, it desiccates everything instantly. And not only is all the water vapor uh, immediately uh, gassed out of it, but it causes the hydrocarbons in the pine needles, in the trunks, in the tar shingles, in the rubber tires, um, in the vinyl siding to start off-gassing. And so that's 100 meters, 200 meters, half a mile, even before the fire gets there. So by the time the fire gets there, all these objects, these hydrocarbon-laden objects, are surrounded in these billowing clouds of volatile vapor. So they burst into flame instantly. And that's why houses in these neighborhoods burnt down in five minutes. And these are half million, three quarter million dollar homes with all the bells and whistles, took a year or two to build. And I was talking to firefighters and they're saying, yeah, that they were going in five or six minutes. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And they said, from a house standing there not involved to flames in the basement was five minutes. And I really thought they were exaggerating. And then I talked to other fire fighters in different parts of the city. They told me the same thing. Then I finally talked to a physicist who specializes in burning homes. And he said, well, yeah, that can happen. But to, in order to understand it better, you might want to understand the Hamburg firestorm uh, of 1943, which was an intentionally set um, firestorm um, lit by thousands of tons of Allied bombs being dropped over the, the city of, uh, the German city of Hamburg. Uh, and that's essentially, in a sense, you could say Fort McMurray bombed itself, uh, just being surrounded by so many uh, incendiary uh, trees and houses. Um, something else that uh, is noteworthy, so towering above this was a pyrocumulonimbus fire cloud. These were novelties in the 1990s. Prior to that, you generally saw them only over volcanoes. And these are storm systems arising out of intense heat. They puncture the stratosphere. They turn the same way hurricanes do. They can produce lightning. They can produce hail. Um, this uh, fire produced a gigantic pyrocumulonimbus fire system that showered black hail back down on the city of Fort McMurray. And you know, we thought that was bad. It was traumatizing to look at. That was why we couldn't see the city of Fort McMurray for many days and wondered what was going on underneath there. The country of Canada, in the fire season of 2023, generated 142 pyrocumulonimbus fire systems. And that is unheard of, unprecedented, on Earth in any time that humans know anything about. It's, it's new territory. It's, these are colossal, colossal amounts of energy. And that's how you get 43 terawatts. So this is hard on firefighters because, you know, one way to think about it is, you know, you had one job. And they went barreling up there the same way firefighters went up the stairs in the World Trade Centers on 9-11, and they went barreling up there, and um, they were thinking, we got this, and they don't, they don't got it. Uh, they immediately lost sight of each other because the smoke was billowing. They had no idea who had left and who was coming. People were trying to get home. Uh, and this, again, only on one road in, one road out. So total chaos ensued. It is an absolute miracle that nobody died in there. Um, heroic measures were taken, but they were not um, taken by putting out fires. They were taken by somehow getting every living soul off these hilltops intact, including the firefighters. Um, this is an instructive uh, image that tells us something about the power of, of 21st century fire. So we, this is a, only a firefighter could have taken this picture. We see the fire hose. It's their most powerful tool. It's their weapon. It's their lightsaber. So they're firing it into these, this outer ring of houses. The inner ring is already a lost cause. That's the boiling inferno you see. And that's, the, uh, that's a block in. Every house is on fire. They're trying to stop this. And by soaking the houses um, in front, 
what's happening is if you follow that hose stream up, you see how it bends? It bends and then it vaporizes. And that's because the fire energy is so intense that it's basically sucking and pulling this very, very powerful stream of water that will clear these seats, you know, in a matter of minutes and knock you off your feet, blow through the door. The fire is, is sucking it off course, vaporizing it, and just sending it up into the fire column where it's going to turn into more hail. So they were basically firefighters were totally disempowered by this thing. And um, more than one firefighter said to me, you know, quite humbly, we got our ass handed to us. And that is wounding to somebody whose mission, whose identity is to protect people, to protect property, to protect their own homes, to protect the homes of their friends and neighbors and co-workers, and they weren't able to do that. I think I'm concerned a little bit that because there were so few deaths in this fire and none in the flames, that um, our sense of urgency um, regarding the, the, the mortal danger these fires pose might be dampened somewhat. You know, and, and when you look at Paradise, California, when you look at uh, Lahaina, um, there were terrible death tolls, and somehow Canada has dodged that. We lost two in Lytton. We lost nine firefighters in the past season. Um, but there haven't been mass deaths. And um, uh, I don't know what, what next year uh, is going to bring. Um, so here we are. Uh, these are. This is what, what are called desperate measures. Um, the hoses weren't working, and they realized that. And so what they started doing, they called in bulldozers and backhoes, and they just started tearing houses down. And these weren't, this looks like this is a house in flames here, but they're actually, he's tearing down, uh, or he's just flattened uh, an intact house, and they were knocking down that same ring that we just saw, that ring of standing houses, they bulldozed it. They tore them all down and tried to create a fire break because as one firefighter said to me, 15-foot flames are easier to deal with than 85-foot flames. So hundreds of houses were knocked down. They eventually stopped that fire. Needless to, uh, in that particular neighborhood on that particular night, the fire burned for days afterward through the city. Um, but. Uh, it's, um, it was a novel approach. It's not what anyone was expecting to do when they, uh, when they started. Um, another characteristic of 21st century fire is it doesn't cool down. And there used to be a little bit of a contract between wild firefighters and the wildfire. At night, there, the temperatures would drop, dew would fall, the fire would still be burning, but it wouldn't be advancing. Now, uh, it never got below 20. Uh, in Fort McMurray and often stayed close to 30 downtown all through the fire, which allows the fire to spread and expand even at night. And some of the, the well, this is at about 3 in the morning, so there, there's a raging fire going on. And this is, um, you know, folks haven't really dealt with this uh, in the past. So back in 2016, when this photo was taken, this was a, a shocking horrifying sight that was almost hard to recognize. But now we're way too familiar with this site. We've seen it in the suburbs of Boulder, Colorado. We've seen it in Montana. We've seen it all over California. We've seen it in BC. We've seen it in Halifax. We've seen it in Alberta. And it's, it's a very shocking landscape uh, to walk around in, uh, the smell of it, the, the utter devastation of it. it um, I really didn't have gray hair when I, so much gray hair when I started writing this book, and, and now I do. And, and one of the things that, that struck me is the similarity of this to this. So this is the tar sands, just uh, 25, 30 kilometers north of that smoking ruin I just showed you. This is another smoking ruin. Uh, that's making uh, certain people vast amounts of money right now. This is a tar sands mine. In the back is Syncrude. Um, you see these kind of rhombus forms in the upper right, those pale squares. Those are huge uh, pyramids, uh, ziggurats of sulfur 
that are by volume bigger than the pyramids at Giza. Uh, in front there, you see these little specks. They look like little sheds or something. Uh, those are um, T797 hauler trucks. They are as big as a house. They weigh 400 tons, empty. Their tires are 13 feet tall and cost $85,000 a piece. And there are hundreds, look how small they look. Uh, there are hundreds of these things roaming these wastelands, uh, these steadily expanding wastelands uh, north of Fort McMurray. It's, I, I think if, if Canadians really understood what was happening up there, um, they would be more shocked than, than they appear to be now. Um, <clears throat> Long before we split the atom, we were tampering with the wizard's book of spells. We wanted fire's fierce energy in a bottle, in a barrel, in a pipeline, and we got it energy to burn, to power the world, and generate wealth beyond our wildest dreams. This is an interesting ad. Uh, back when it was a virtue to be able to melt glaciers with oil power. Uh, this is from Life Magazine, a very popular weekly uh, from my childhood. Um, this is from 1962, actually, the year I was born. Each day, Humble, a subsidiary of, of Exxon, Esso, supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. And ain't it great? And uh, you just can't realize how people thought about things back then. It's not that long ago, but it, there was, it was a very different consciousness. And what's amazing is the people behind this ad were at a very um, concentrated conference in 1959 in which the physicist Edwin Teller, uh, Edward Teller gave them, kind of schooled them on the impact of um, fossil fuel generated CO2. And he talked to them in terms of glaciers melting, of sea level rising. And it's hard to know if an ad agency just sort of spun that into a virtue uh, but, you know, something was spinning there, for sure. Um, but as big oil, with our often willing assistance, supercharges our economy and its own bottom line with record profits, it's also supercharging our atmosphere with record quantities of greenhouse gases. CO2 levels are now fully 50% higher than they were in pre-industrial times. So there we see, down at the left, 1960, Edward Teller's talk at Columbia University. This was a, a symposium on energy and man that had a lot of um, big oil heavies, including the uh, president of what is now Suncor. He was there. He heard Edward Teller warn them about uh, the impact of expanding, the risk of expanding um, uh, petroleum use. Um, and these are just... Um, milestones in climate awareness. There was a really important report delivered to Lyndon Johnson's desk in 1965 in the White House. Again, talking about CO2, talking about um, anthropogenic warming, uh, just using slightly different language. The first World Climate Conference was in 79, and on we go. Um, these heat-trapping gases have skewed our climate in easily measurable ways, and all you need really, to see what's happening is a thermometer and a calendar. So we're going back to 1850 here. We were kind of in a bit of a cooling period there, a couple of weird spikes. Um, there was a little peak uh, in World War II. It settled back down. And then it just began this steady march. And once again, you see this kind of triangle of red, but there's this outlier at the far right hand that's 2023 that just kind of took off on its own. It's like it's got a balloon attached to it. And, um, uh, you know, it's not coming back down. 1996 is probably the coolest year that any of us um, uh, will remember. And so there's something that we need to be really clear on, and that is coal, which is still burned widely for energy, 
is an 18th century fuel. Oil, which still drives about 80% of the world's economic activity, is a 19th century fuel. The internal combustion engine was prototyped in 1860. Standard Oil, Exxon Esso, was founded in 1870. Bitumen, the stuff they mine and melt in Fort McMurray, is not a fuel at all. It is a driveway sealer. In ancient times, it was used as mortar to stick bricks together. In Alberta, Dene people used it to seal their canoes. It takes billions of cubic feet of natural gas every day to melt and fractionate bitumen into substances southern petroleum markets will want to buy. Again, we just crossed the four million barrel a day mark up in Fort Mac. So why on earth are we still doing this, especially when scientists have understood the basics of the greenhouse effect literally since the 18th century? We've understood the heat-retaining characteristics of CO2 since the 1850s. Scientists were speculating on industrial CO2's potential for altering the climate by the 1890s. Evidence that this was actually happening was visible by the 1930s. The only reason we labor so hard to liberate coal, oil, and gas from the ground is so we can burn it. In other words, if you're in the petroleum industry, you're in the fire industry, which means you're in the CO2 industry, which means you're in the climate changing industry. What's alarming and possibly indictable is the fact that petroleum companies have known and discussed this for more than half a century. In fact, they've been leaders in climate science. So some really amazing investigative work was done back in 2015 by uh, Neela Banerjee and Inside Climate News, also the LA Times, uh, and then um, uh, Naomi Oreskes and uh, uh, Supron, I forget, Jeffrey Supron, uh, all did uh, terrific investigative work getting into uh, the old files of big oil companies and big automotive companies, and they were earnestly studying climate and its impacts. And because Exxon, in 1982, was the biggest corporation in the world, the wealthiest corporation in the world, it could hire the best scientists. And it did. And it put them on the climate file. And it said, figure out where this is all going. We understand that CO2 retains heat. We understand that it's a product of uh, our industry. So what are the impacts going to be? And so that uh, we're starting at 1850, going out to about 2150. And that fat horizontal arrow you see is natural fluctuation without the influence of anthropogenic CO2. That second arrow that takes off right around 2000 is what they predicted would happen if we kept on developing petroleum resources as they were developing in the 1970s and 80s. So this is science really from the late 70s that they solidified in the early 80s and, and published and distributed among themselves. This is an in-house memo. And they predicted uh, exactly, you see the temperature on the left, uh, one, two, three degrees. Um, they nailed it. And, and that departure became noticeable right around 2000, which is when a lot of us started feeling um, uh, a difference in our world. This foreknowledge presented a quandary. How do you separate oil from fire or burning from emissions? You can't. And so starting in the 1980s, the industry, along with its allies in business and government, in churches, in finance and in the media embarked on a disinformation campaign to disavow and undermine their own science. And they've been doing it ever since. When they were called out on this, they tried greenwashing, but they were called out on that too. And now in 2024, we find ourselves in an untenable contradiction. 
It took me seven years to figure it out. But this is a fact. The petroleum industry, the, the energy industry, uh, is a servant of fire. And if any of you have read Botany of Desire by Michael Pollan, looking at uh, apples and marijuana and potatoes and tulips, these really quite humble regional plants that attracted human interest in ways that caused them to be disseminated by humans across the globe in a way that the ultimate domestication of humans by another entity is fires, domestication of us. And fire now burns more broadly, more intensely across the globe than at any other time in human history. We have to ask ourselves, how is it that the fossil fuel industry, the planet's biggest contributor of carbon emissions, along with the banks that finance it, the governments that subsidize it, and the industries that capitalize on it, gets a pass from responsibility to the citizenry and to life on Earth? Capitalism, as it is currently practiced, would have you believe that it exists outside of real-world consequences, that it is magically unaccountable to chemistry and physics, the hard laws that govern our world. There's no longer any attempt to cover their ambitions up. Thanks in part to Putin's invasion of Ukraine, Big Oil has basically said, the money's too good. Exxon's Darren Woods got a 50% pay raise last year, while the median Exxon employee's wage dropped by 10%. Alberta's own Suncor enjoyed record profits too, while they fired 1,500 workers and sold off their side business in renewable energy. Not profitable enough. Shell just announced it's doing the same thing. Profits, shareholders, and dividends, it seems, come first second and third, before workers, before the climate, before common decency and common sense. Even the Wall Street Journal, historically friendly to big business and big oil, is calling them out now. Last summer, they published an expose entitled Inside Exxon's Strategy to Downplay Climate Change. Last fall, the National Post went after Suncor's new CEO, Rich Kruger, following his testimony in Ottawa, in which I also testified, and where the man dodged climate questions from the NDP's Charlie Angus, the way Neo dodges bullets in the matrix. And to their credit, uh, the uh, National Post covered that, covered his evasiveness. This is sort of a chilling concept, another one from Alex Steffen predatory delay, the deliberate slowing of change to prolong a profitable but unsustainable status quo whose costs will be paid by others. That is basically what the energy industry and the automotive industry and their collaborators have been doing with our help uh, since the 60s, really for most of our lives. It, it's kind of shocking to consider. Why would an oil company want to do that? John Kenneth Galbraith, a U.S. economist, ambassador, and author, born in Canada, wrote, people of privilege will risk their complete destruction rather than surrender any material part of their advantage. Tupac Shakur put it a little more bluntly, fuck all y'all. <laughs> I think it draw, derives from an elemental instinct for self-preservation that some might call selfishness or greed. But then I also think of Chandra Linder. On the one hand, the city's on fire. On the other, I still want to do my dry cleaning, or mine for copper, or drill another SAG-D wellbore, or pass my chemistry exam, or raise my child. All of us have plans, and very few of them include climate change. And this is where we find ourselves in 2024. Canadian forests and grasslands will very likely burn again, and smoke may once again blanket the East Coast. 
The earth is telling us by every means available, flood, fire, heat, and wind, that we need to tra transition away from carbon-intensive energy as fast as possible. We could do this by choosing policy and elected officials who prioritize climate and environmental health and safety, which is our health and safety. And we can make choices in our own communities about how we derive our energy and about how we want to live and how much we want to live. I want to leave you with a really potent word, and that word is, is reverescence. It means revitalize, regenerate, regrow. This is what the earth wants to do. Growing and flourishing is the earth's default mode. After the fire passes over, this is what's waiting underground. Remember how hot it was. In these basements, they turned into kilns. That's a house foundation behind these flowers. Steel melted in there. Toilets, ceramic toilets vaporized. And yet these tulip bulbs, planted by human hands, six inches underground, endured. And they just waited there. It was spring, it was time to go, but it was insanely hot. It was otherworldly hot. And they waited, and somehow they endured. And now here they are. And what that says to me, what I see in that, is do your worst to me, and I will still return in beauty. I took a teaching from that. Those tender bulbs, planted by human hands, ended up being the most durable part of that neighborhood, the only things that survived. I'm going to leave it there. Um, and there will be time for questions, if you like. But um, uh, thank you for coming out. Thank you for listening. And I'm so glad you're here. Thank you so much for that wonderful um, talk, John. I was, I was in Fort McMurray a few months after the fire, the year after in 2017. My parents had to leave town in Williams Lake because the fires got to the edge of town. And uh, of course, after Lytton um, visiting there as well, everyone in this room probably has a story to tell of knowing somebody in the Okanagan or friends who work as uh, firefighters and the movement of change, and, and so thank you so much for your talk. We have a few people here to uh, respond to your talk and share some things from their own uh, perspective. Uh, Jeff Mann is here. He's a distinguished professor of geography at SFU. He's a regular contributor to the London Review of Books, author of In the Long Run, We're All Dead, uh, Keynesianism, Political Economy, and Revolution. Um, he's a Guggenheim Fellow, Senior Fellow at the Institute for New Economic uh, thinking, and this year he's at the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. So uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, introduce Tara and Seth, but I'm going to let Jeff go first because he's on Eastern Standard Time uh, out there. Uh, Tara Mahoney, my colleague uh, from the Re Research and Engagement Coordinator with SFU's Community Engaged Research Initiative. She holds a PhD from the School of Communication at SFU. Uh, she teaches here as well, but has been um, involved um, in uh, climate change communications with the David Suzuki Foundation and longtime creative director of Gen Y Media working on climate change issues. Seth Klein is the team lead and director of strategy with the Climate Emergency Unit. Many of you will remember and know him from uh, setting up and working as director of the BC office of the Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives and, of course, the author of A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency. I'm going to pass it over to Jeff, uh, first of all, to, to start. Go ahead, Jeff. I hope we can hear you. Not yet. Just give it a second. It'll get fixed. Oh, you're muted, Jeff. 
Oh, that's my fault. <laughs> After all these years. At least people can see the real me, because that's the way I always seem to do it. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. So uh, I just want to say thanks very much for uh, having me be part of this, even though I'm far away. John and I are old friends, um, so this is actually a really nice chance to tell him again how awesome this book is. The talk was equally compelling, and uh, both my partner and I, Michelle, were very glad to, to take part, even though we're far away. So I'm going to talk for like two minutes, because I know people didn't come to listen to me. Um, but I just wanted to say uh, basically three awesome things about this book uh, that I think we should all be very grateful for. The first, I think, is that John looks head on at, um, well, I guess what I would say is the relationship between, the kind of crazy relationship between our uncertainty and the, and the, the scientific knowledge that we have right now. I mean, I think, as he said tonight, we, I think we have a really good idea of it from a scientific perspective of the possible paths ahead. The IPCC itself has, you know, set out these red, uh, representative concentration pathways to tell us what the concentrations might do to our temperatures. Then it's also created these things they call uh, shared socioeconomic pathways that tell us about the kind of life that perhaps societies might be living. Um, so we have this kind of scientific knowledge about how the Earth might operate in the future. But I think we have really no idea at all what the world will look like when we get there for us and how we in our communities will respond to it and how we will have changed along the way between now and whatever that future looks like. And I think John in the book gives a really visceral sense because he talks to so many people coming from so many different places. He gives us a really visceral sense of that, that combination of knowledge and uncertainty of like what you might call foresight and darkness that, that were paired tonight as well, obviously. And I think that while daunting, um, we need to look this in the face and, and uh, more than maybe any other book I've read recently, and I read a shitload of books about climate, um, this book looks those things right in the face. Um, but it doesn't do so to then slump its shoulders and walk away. And that's what I think is also crucial about this book is that he really attends to what I, I don't know how to describe it other than to use kind of fancy terminology like our horizon of expectations. And I have to say, for me, this is the thing I worry about the most at this moment in time. We know that climate change is bad. We know that it's getting worse. John told that story much better than I ever will in the book and again tonight. And what I worry about the most is that if we tell a narrative that the future is one of atomization, people turning on each other, people going every person for themselves because the world is falling apart, then I think that's the world we'll get because people will expect it and they'll make it come true. And that one of the key tasks right now is not only to address climate change, to mitigate it as much as possible, to help us adapt to it as much as possible, but to also think seriously about how we're building the societies that will have to deal with the kinds of changes that John's describing. And I think, of course, we get kind of hopeful stories from John in a way, even for people who have had to live through the really hell of this. Like there's a woman in his book who I found quite compelling named Carol Christian, who seems after her house is destroyed, sort of simultaneously traumatized and also kind of astounded in a sort of curious way at how something like that could even happen. Um, and remarkably resilient in the face of, you know, a significant amount of personal destruction. But I, I worry that we're going to need to do a lot of work to create a lot of Carol Christians for the future ahead. And I guess I shouldn't say I worry. I just feel like we really need to create a lot of Carol Christians for the work ahead. And that means building a world in which people expect support, solidarity, mutual care in the face of the kinds of changes that John's telling us is coming and every other scientist has been telling us is coming, as he said, for at least 50 years. Um, and I think that this book does that work for us. It doesn't, it doesn't slump its shoulders that I said it, it 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 looks these things in the face but not without hope and then the last thing I want to say just very quickly is that this is a proof that a great writing still matters so much you know maybe it always will I hope it always will but, but you know this book is just sings that yeah thank you thank you so much uh, Jeff I'm going to pass it over to, to Tara can I um, I, I just have a, first of all, Jeff, it's really great to see you. You're, you're terrifyingly huge. Um, <laughs> but besides that, you're you just like in familiar. real life. Uh, you, you loom large. Uh, and 
and you were, I just really wanted to address the atomization. And, and I think it, these, you know, these, these zombie, flesh-eating uh, disaster movies that um, we explore some of these breakdowns through is one scenario. And then there's Fort McMurray. And so the one thing I forgot to say about Fort McMurray, you can't believe it, but in 2016, I looked at the census, there are 80, 80 different first languages spoken up there. Many different religions, many different nations represented, many different concepts of what community is, of what danger is, of what, how you might even respond. And so this incredibly complex kind of Miami or Toronto level uh, international outpost, unique in the world, gathered together in this chaos where the leadership really did let them down in many ways. There were many brave individual policemen and firefighters and other first responders who did heroic work, but there, there was the, the evacuation call came, you know, as you saw, rather late. And yet, uh, all those different languages, all those different people were gathered up in the net of collective humanity and all pulled safely. Not a single person died in the flames. And how many, you know, how many cities, this was 80,000 people in an afternoon, total chaos. Uh, and I think we should study that much more closely. So, and I think we should derive hope from that. Uh, and, because you could say, well, that was Canadians. Well, what are Canadians? Well, there's 80 different languages and, uh, and coming from, you know, really different points of view. And I interviewed a bunch of them and they've got really different takes on that fire. And, and yet, you know, when, when it really hit the fan, when it became absolutely cataclysmically desperate, humanity prevailed and everybody got to hug their kid the next day. Thank you so much for joining us, Jeff, from the, the East Coast. So good to see you. Tara, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for your talk and for your book. Um, I really especially appreciated your last slide. I thought that was so such a beautiful and poetic way to end the talk. Um, so I had two kind of themes I wanted to comment on. Um, one was um, the role of journalism um, in covering the climate crisis. So. Um, Seth and I actually worked on this report here, Quiet Alarm, which looked at um, the CBC's climate reporting over a two-week period in May of last year. And um, what we found, well, so first of all, um, there's an underestimated uh, lack of climate literacy in the Canadian public. So if you can believe this, I mean, probably not in this room, but um, only 55% of the Canadian public understand that climate change is caused by greenhouse gases. Um, and um, in our study, we found that in, uh, in, in the CBC's reporting, so the public, broadca public broadcaster's reporting, only 9% of the climate items that we cataloged mentioned the connection between the burning of fossil fuels and climate change. Only 22% of the stories that we looked at talked about solutions, and only 6% of the stories that we looked at gave citizens at large something to do, gave a sense of you know, agency or that there was a way for them to get engaged. Um, so yeah, this, this idea of like what is the role of journalism and storytellers in the climate crisis, and this is kind of related to the second issue I wanted to talk about um, in relation to hope. Um, and especially young people. So I, I've worked a lot in, in uh, youth engagement, and um, and you know we're dealing with a mental health crisis among youth in relation to this issue. I mean, it's it's affecting all of us, but especially young people. I have two two young kids, and um, and we know in, in climate communications that fearful representations of the climate. Uh, to be honest, like your book kind of scared the shit out of me. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if other people were, heart were racing, but um, and it, it's not a criticism of your work because I think it's a super important thing that you're saying and story that you're telling. But in climate communication, it's understood that fear-based narratives don't actually motivate people to act. Um, in short increments, they do. So people might get scared and want to do something right away. But over the long term, it, it actually has an eroding effect on people's um, sense of engagement. 
Um, and so, and then this idea of like doomerism. So doomerism, you know, doom-based stories are now, you know, in, in a lot of climate communication circles compared to um, like denialism in their ability to um, lead to disempowerment and apathy and resentment and escapism. And so um, I, I, I don't know if it's a question, but those are the kind of themes that are kind of coming up in response to your book. And, and what responsibility do we have to the younger generation to be honest about the, the severity of the crisis, but also to open up their minds to what could be next that could be positive and could be worth working for and what the human spirit is capable of. Um, and you kind of already spoke to it a little bit, but I'd love to, to go there in the conversation. Thanks so much, uh, Tara. Sure, I got a, a, a couple of things to say there. First of all, I, when I think about you know, what to do next, I think one of them is I, I really want to talk to young people uh, in, a, in a real way about, about that. And I think the, the counter, when, the times that I've gone into high schools and, and you know, people are, the kids are you know, very, very open about their anxieties and often pretty literate, you know, and these would be probably kind of selected high school groups that I would get to speak to that would have me. But I think the, the, the counterweight to this is this incredible momentum of renewable energy. And there are, you know, Nebraska, which is not exactly the most liberal state that we ever thought of, I think is getting about 85% of its electricity from renewables now. And this is happening across multiple US states. It's happening in European countries. And China is just, you know, exploding, of course. And, and so there is this kind of, um, I'm not really a mathematician, maybe is it a logarithmic or exponential uh, increase year on year? So, and, and I, I was thinking about this a couple of years ago, I, I, I felt like, I felt this kind of smartphone-like momentum in, in renewable energy. And I don't know if you remember, in 2006, really nobody had a smartphone. And in 2008, everybody except me had one. And, <laughs> And now uh, they're ubiquitous. And I think we're in a moment like that. I mean, obviously, the energy system is so much bigger, and the petroleum industry is so entrenched and so bound up in everything we do. I mean, we really aren't people of the corn. We're, we're people of the hydrocarbon. And you know, just everything around us is, is informed by that industry in some very, very beneficial ways. And, and you know, that's another piece of this, is how do we show our gratitude uh, as unfashionable as that may be, to the petroleum industry for what it's given us, because it's given us a lot. And then also bravely at the same time acknowledge that it is time, past time, to transition. And I think that that is a world that young people are coming up into, which is an electrified world, a renewable world, where that isn't just a pipe dream and it isn't just recycling your plastics that are never going to get recycled. We're actually getting our energy in different ways that you can see and touch and be involved with. And so, I mean, I think for mental health, people need to be engaged in some task that feels germane to the concern that they feel. And it doesn't need to be huge. It isn't realistically going to be huge. Uh, it's going to be a local activity. And there are a lot of opportunities for that. And I think now, many, many templates. So I feel excited about that. That's why I don't really feel like a doomer. You know, as, as intense and terrifying as what goes on, that's what they told me, that's what I saw. So that's just how, you know, it, it is out there for some people. But there's also this other parallel reality. And, and that's, you know, one of the, the, the deeper, the kind of the more koan-like teachings that, that I got from writing this book over seven years was the world is both and, always, always, always. It's going to be falling apart and rebuilding constantly. And we're going to lose a lot, and a bunch of new things are going to come up. And it was implausible that those tulips would survive that kind of heat. I don't know why they did. The person who planted them certainly never prepared for that or planned for that. But there's a lot of unanticipated things are going to happen. It's easy to focus on the negative, but nobody ever imagined that 100% of Fort McMurray would escape from a fire like that. The fire chief certainly didn't. He openly said that he said, if we got away with a few hundred deaths, we'd be lucky. That's what he said. So 
We did much better than that. And there's so many things we can do so much better uh, at and are capable of, so. Thank you, thank you, John. Seth. Thanks, hi everyone. Um, so just out of curiosity, how many of you have actually read the book? <laughs> All right, about half. So um, I, uh, I've also known John for a while. I, I, uh, I loved this book. <laughs> <laughs> um, and as, as Jeff said, I mean, you all just saw, he's a very good speaker, but he is a great writer. And there's a reason why this book ended up on all of these, you know, must read books of the year. Um, the writing is beautiful and exquisite and uh, compelling. As someone who also writes, I read it often with a sense of uh, jealousy. And uh, <laughs> you know the sign that of good writing is when you're, when you're in bed and you're reading and, you, and, and your partner's also reading, and you keep interrupting your partner to read passages aloud. <laughs> that, that was my experience with this book. Thank you. Uh, now my wife has to read it, um, the parts she hasn't heard. Um, uh, and one of the things I particularly admire about John as a writer too, so obviously it centers on this Fort McMurray fire, but and then it just rifts into exploring all kinds of things. And John is, is a pattern seer. He sees patterns across geography and across time that he pulls into this story. Um, and for someone whose work is, in, is all about climate all the time, I, I really appreciated that how John um, put the climate emergency in some truly original language and very compelling frames, the whole, you know, just as we're all getting accustomed to thinking of ourselves as living in the Anthropocene, John introduces that we are in fact in the Petrocene, that, that reference to 21st century fire, um, and the fact, this idea that we're just not living in the same place uh, in, a brand new, in a brand new landscape. Um, you know, we all remember when the fire occurred and watching it on the news, but I know in my case, I certainly wasn't paying near enough attention. And the book, of course, as you heard, captures what happens when wildfire jumps and just starts treating all these structures as so many more trees. And how firefighters have to relearn what it is that they're doing. And it really just so vividly captures that whole play-by-play -play of the largest evacuation in North American history. I certainly didn't appreciate it at the time that that's what was unfolding. Um, all out of that single highway. You know, that scene that you described with the dry cleaners, it's really an allegory for the denial we're all in. Um, and, and to pick up on, on your exchange with, with Jeff, too, um, part of what was so remarkable about the story to me was with so much that could have and should have gone wrong, um, that most you know, there's echoes of, of Rebecca Solnit's work that in the end, in disaster, in the main, most people behaved magnificently. Um, one of the standout scenes to me was as everyone was in their cars just inching out of there on that one highway, and there's that one guy whose name I forget who has that impulse to just gun it. He wants to save his family. And, he, and his wife looks at him in the car, and she can sense it, and she says, don't be that guy. <laughs> and he doesn't. Um, uh, so I just want to share, um, can I read my favorite excerpt? There were so many I liked. That Hamburg, ref the, the, the Hamburg piece was chilling. Um, and it made me think about Gaza. Um, but as someone who works in the climate space in particular and, and has to deal with climate deniers, I thought the book did a really good way, a really good job of inviting those people to think about this in a different way. So I want to read my favorite part, okay? Um, <laughs> this is how good the writing is. Our atmosphere envelops the cosmic sand grain of Earth just as bitumen envelops a grain of bituminous, bituminous sand, just as our skin envelops our own bodies. Relative to what they are covering, each of these insulating layers is gossamer thin. The vertical distance from sea level where most of humans live 
to icy suffocation at Camp 4 on Mount Everest is less than five miles, a mere 0.06% of Earth's 8,000 mile diameter. Put another way, your skin is 10 times thicker relative to your body than the habitable portion of the atmosphere is relative to Earth. And then he goes on, in addition to being extraordinarily flammable, petroleum is lethally toxic, both in its liquid and vapor forms. In light of this, it is almost spooky how comfortable we are traveling with powerful poisonous bombs positioned directly behind our children's car seats. <laughs> there is a palpable dissidence between this and the auto industry's recent preoccupation with safety that only intensifies when you consider a car's emissions. Exhaust fumes, like the atmosphere they flow into, are mostly invisible and easy to keep out of mind. But if that, he had referenced this Silverado, if the Silverado's tailpipe were directed back into the vehicle, the driver and all of her passengers would be dead in minutes. If the Silverado's exhaust pipe were, in, uh, were piped into the driver's living room, she and her family would be dead in an hour. But somehow, when we run our cars outside, in our shared atmosphere, all that soot and toxic gases magically disappear. Earth's atmosphere may be huge and invisible, but it is also a, as finite as a room. What happens in it stays in it. It is hard to remember or even believe when we gaze skyward through our dome transparent ceiling, past our lone moon and lonelier sun, toward the legions of luminous pinpricks beyond it. From our tiny vantage, it is nearly impossible to truly apprehend that we exist inside a closed container, together with every other living thing, every fire, and every molecule of our cumulative emissions. And it is even more difficult to accept the possibility that humans could conjure up an insult large enough or noxious enough to impact the integrity of something so apparently limitless and vast. So for like, you know, for all these deniers who think you can't see it, by what logic could we spend 200 years pumping this stuff into this closed container and not expect what we're now witnessing? Um, the last thing I'll just say, you know, it's an academic space, so we're supposed to critique. The, the, uh, <laughs> so I'll leave now. <laughs> I'll, the one thing I would say, but I say it, it, you know, in fairness, no book can do it all. Um, the, but the solutions feel incongruent. You knew it was coming. Um, you, you see hope, you know, in, in the end there, in, in the market moving to these renewables and, and in legal actions. Uh, I don't, not by themselves. And in particular, on the market side, like, well, even as you alluded to with Kruger and, and Suncor, like, one of the things I love about the book is how much respect you have for working people. But the market doesn't give a shit about these people. And uh, they'll leave them on the scrap heap of history. Um, whereas in contrast, there's nothing around the role of movements or, or politics or how we force these governments yeah. to be in emergency mode. Yeah. I'll leave it there. Did you want to um, respond? Yeah, there's a lot of room for um, probably improvement and certain, certainly more. Um, uh, yeah, there's only so far one can go. but. Um, that is, you know, the, the next piece, the missing piece, and, and um, hoping to learn more about that. Uh, as far as um, reaching across this divide, you know, I, I thought a lot about, I, I, I really came to be fond of the people that I interviewed in Alberta, and they were really good to me, and they didn't have to be. And so I feel protective of them. And I wanted, I thought about them every day as I was writing, you know, how would, how would this, sentence go over with Carol. What would Paul think of this? And, you know, I described them honestly, and I described the industry honestly, um, but I was still thinking I would really like this to be a book that Albertans would, would read, and plenty of Albertans read, and uh, um, <laughs> the, uh, um, I, the, um, did not mean that to sound the way it sounded. Uh, um, it's actually been, pr it's been pretty damn quiet coming out of Fort McMurray. Um, though I just heard um, uh, one of this, my, the folks I interviewed in there, I won't uh, name them, but 
um, they wanted to get in touch with me on behalf of Suncor, apparently. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, having met Suncor's CEO, new CEO, and shaken his hand and stared into his eyes, which was a spooky experience. But um, so I don't, none of you probably remember who uh, um, Stephen Harper's head of communications was back in the day, but he read Fireweather. He lives in England now. He works in public relations over there for somebody. And he read Fireweather and tweeted enthusiastically about it. And so he was shocked by it, alarmed by it, and very enthusiastic about having other people read it. So I thought that was interesting. You know, this is a guy who served for 10 years massaging basically predatory delay, uh, perfecting it. Uh, and yet, left to his own devices, and alone with this book, maybe after 10 or 20 years of reflection, um, he had it in him to uh, not just read it, but actually enthuse to others how much it affected him. And so that is something. Yeah. Um, we have a reception and a book signing to go to, so we're going to take two questions from the audience. Anything that we don't get to, you'll be able to speak directly to John uh, next door. We have a question right there. Comment. I think another one right over here after. Go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Um, I work in the environmental field, um, and one of the things... Uh, there's so many solutions out there, and I was just wondering if you had mentioned some of the programs that are coming up nowadays, like Fire Smart, which is an amazing program. There's so much of this destruction that can be overcome by actually working with um, our, our the environment around our houses on the in the Wui area, um, as well. Um, if you're familiar with Project Draw Drawdown, and Dr. Foley has an amazing, I saw him speak at the Zero Waste Conference. Um, just if people are looking for something to lighten, um, uh, there's some great work at UBC as well. Dr. Zhao speaking about the psychology of making this a positive change because I have so many friends who are just, I can't, I can't. I can't. They have their one thing and they're siloed and it's, we're going to have to be able to open it up. And if, unless we do it joyfully, pe people get paralyzed. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. We'll take one more question there, and then I'll get the, the thank panel you for to that. respond, and, yeah. and we'll go ahead. Uh, yeah, thank you so much for that book, John. We, my book club and I, we all loved it. I grew up in Alberta. Chilling book. Um, there was one part of it that I really was curious about, and that is the decision to tear down perfectly good buildings when you're fighting a fire must be a very difficult one. And I just wonder if there was any uh, insight into how those decisions were made or how that decision gets made. Um, I, I think, um, did everybody hear that question? I, I guess it's, yeah, it's all mic'd. Uh, so it was obviously a really, diff it, it didn't come really until day two. Uh, it was, it was the, so the fire was on the third. This was on the morning of the fifth. So now the fire's already been raging in the city for 36 hours. And all their method, the water wasn't working. And these, there were a couple of very out-of-the-box thinkers in, in the Prospect neighborhood where that just, where that, you know, bulldozing took place. And these were guys from, in fact, Slave Lake, who had seen their own town burn five years earlier and had a lot of time to sort of think about and process um, what worked and what didn't. And basically, they were looking at, the, it, it's such a, what climate change is going to force us to do is, is think about things that are familiar to us in very novel and, and potentially dissonant ways. And the idea of thinking about a house, it's a home, it's a place you raise your kids, it's a sanctuary, it's an investment. They were thinking about it as fuel, as an accelerant to an out of control fire. And they were able to make that, that kind of psychological and technical and practical leap and disassociate from, this is where my friend lives, this house is worth a pile of money, I wish I had a house like this, to we need to level this thing if we want to have any chance of slowing this fire down. And that is an example, I think, of the kind of mental uh, 
leaping and reframing that we're going to have to do probably for the rest of our lives in all kinds of ways. And so while that was traumatizing, and, and I interviewed the bulldozer and, and backhoe operators, and you get to see what they saw, and it was weird for them to be doing that. Um, but at the same time, they actually succeeded in containing the fire in that neighborhood, and there was a whole commercial district that they saved as a result of that. So they made a relatively small sacrifice of maybe 50 houses and saved hundreds and a bunch of businesses. So it's also kind of recalculating what it's, it's, a, it's challenging what all our values are. And I think there's going to be a lot of that too around what we feel entitled to in terms of how much water we use every day, how much energy we use every day. And all that's going to be shifting. And a lot of it can be positive. And so they had a victory among many, many losses, even though it didn't look like a victory to us who all are going to go home to houses that are safe and stable and that we depend on and could never imagine having bulldozed. Uh, and, but you know, if you read the news, there are plenty of people whose homes are getting bulldozed. And so this was done in peacetime in Canada, and that's really shocking. But um, it's uh, the fact that they were able to go there um, and actually carry it through was a kind of a, sort of a great leap forward in the context of that conflagration. And it's really hard for us to imagine here, and I hope that by reading that chapter, you can kind of get in and see the logic of what, of, of what they were doing. And you know, it's a horrifying concept, but it, it actually worked. Uh, I just want to say thank you to Seth and Tara and, and Jeff, and thank you, John, for writing such a beautiful, exquisite book and bringing us all together uh, this evening. And thank, thank you. thank you all for, for being here, and please join us uh, in the World Art Center. For thank you all. Thanks a lot.